So what's this this study that you thing the thing you posted yesterday on Canada? I'm you're curious about that. I mean, can can is there enough information to actually have attribution to cause or? Yeah. So well. I can't definitively say yes. So, uh, you know, Dr. Karen McDonald? I've probably come across her work, but I don't know her personally. So it's a him. He is the that head of the science. Already right there. <laughs> you haven't met him. Um, so Carrie, a uh, really good friend of mine, he's um, amazing. Like, you would love his stuff. Yeah. I mean, just so far up your alley. The... Uh, so he did his PhD in kind of injury study, injury prevention study okay. at the University of Calgary. Uh, he always says, I'm a coach first, but he's also, you know, a PhD in kinesiology and right. incredible statistician and epidemiologist. And he coached at, I think it was either Calgary, or Alberta, and then he got the gig over at uh, University of British Columbia, actually led them to the championship his second year. Um, he did our initial validation study. That was part of his PhD. Okay. And he's got, he's, he has some of the, just the best information. Like he, uh, for example, with his previous team that he took over, only 25% of the players when they graduated were playing anymore just because they're beat to crap. Right. Uh, you know, he kind of goes over the stats of the injuries uh, and how we became closest. One of his biggest stories was with my UBC team, because of what we do with Vert, you know, that championship season, no one missed a practice. 85% of our team still plays after graduation. Like right. he's, he's been at the forefront of applying acute chronic workload ratios and volleyball. Um, he was so successful. In fact, that the volleyball Canada created the head of sports science, sports medicine position. And he now oversees that for their youth through their national team. Sure. Okay. Um, and so he's, he's, he also is uh, because he's, I think he's still technically a professor at U, U, UBC. He also gets sent a lot of validation studies to, you know, approve if they're mm -hmm. going to get published or not. Right. Um, and I'm doing a call with a gentleman named Marco. He's in Mexico. Ruth actually introduced me to him. He does that Stolo, Somos Todos Volleyball. Todos Somos Volleyball, yeah. I'm actually going to go on there, I think, either late April or early May. So I was on with him like a month or so ago. Uh-huh. And I was able to do 97% of it in Spanish. Okay. I'm, not a, I'm not a native speaker. Uh, he, he said it a very good job, but it was great. We we're getting, I mean, a lot of interest from South America. But, you know, he's like, so I want to talk to other people. And I was like, well, and he really want to talk about injury prevention. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I have the guy for you. And I'll, I'll see if Carrie's in. So, so we, I introduced him to Carrie the other day. And Carrie was kind of going through the presentation he recently did with some provincial studies they'd done. Okay. I haven't been able to get into the, the crux of it, but what I will say is if Carrie's talking about it, it's, it's got backing. Like they've, right. it's got enough data to where he's confident in the results. Gotcha. Uh, so essentially what they found was there's two things was they were talking about, you know, we, we talked about ankle and hip and knee and back and mm -hmm. all stuff you're pretty well aware of ankles, number one, uh, then knee. And then he goes, back's actually lower. And then when he said that, I'm like, what about as you get older? He goes, exactly. As you go, as you test older <laughs> populations, like collegiate, the national team, back starts going. Boop. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Which makes sense. Um, <clears throat> but this was mainly for youth. Because we, we, we kind of wanted to focus more on, on youth. Think like 14 to 18, I think, sure. is what he, was the study was on. He okay. said that the, the, what's interesting is, is in all sports, football, basketball, concussions, concussion rates are higher in game than in practice all right volleyball's the anomaly okay so there's more concussions generally during practice interesting in and one of the highest points is warm-up and he shows you know like a video in the presentation i'm gonna actually have him send me the presentation so i can look at it more because it's a really it's a i really think it's one of the best best presentations i've seen for the i mean collegiate but really the club coaches mm -hmm. i mean it's Really straightforward, simplified. It's like, here's why this happens. But what they did in Canada, and I don't think that, I don't know if it was a provincial or a national thing, but they made a new rule. And I, again, I don't know if it was a year or two years ago. Those are the details I don't recall. But it was, you know, when you come up and you're doing your hitting lines and warm up, you can't hit and go under the net and then right. get yep. back to from behind. <laughs> right. And, and they saw a statistically significant drop in concussions when they said you have to hit and walk around. 
Okay. And then the other part was they found because, because I thought that was wild. You weren't allowed to block in a lot of Canadian provinces because you'd be too close to the hitter mm-hmm. from COVID-19. Right. Yep. And Carrie's like, yeah, we saw, we, we saw a significant spike in, in concussions because these defensive players are just getting rocked. Okay. Yeah, but the, I also said one... I anticipate they're going to become even better at digging. <laughs> <laughs> Those the, who don't have lasting effects from the concussion. Yeah, the the question that would have, that immediately comes to mind in that regard, in terms of the spike, is could there be some element of that that's just simply the fact that you've gotten deconditioned athletes? Sure, sure. I mean, there, there's there's going to be a ton of variables, and frankly. I'm going to make the assumption because I know him that Kerry will have uh, looked at most of those variables. You're going to have reaction times down. If, if kids aren't sleeping as well, which I almost guarantee you is the case, mm-hmm. reaction times are going to go down. Yep. Uh, I think, you know, I've talked about it in previous conversations where, you know, I'll be looking at, at client data, be it, you know, sleep data, vert data, HRV data, whatever. Some of our clients will just look at everything they have. And what, what, you know, say like, so what do you think this is going on? I'm like, I have, I have no freaking idea. <laughs> that, that's right when the U S elections were taking place. Uh, her grandmother could have had COVID like. Right. <laughs> too, far too many variables right now for, uh, for me to try to, you know, say, Hey, there's a spike in her jumps. Well, not really. You're most programs have actually been really, really responsible. Right. Um, yep. from what I've been able to see, it's been great. They've been very, mm-hmm. but, but yeah. On that, on that, the, the, since you brought sleep up, maybe you don't know the answer to this. Maybe you do. I like many people have a device on my wrist. It's a low end device. It's not mm-hmm. as fancy as a, you know, as some of the better ones, but it does at least theoretically track my sleep at night. And it differentiates between deep sleep and light sleep. Yep. What should that be like? What sort of balance should be should I be seeing between deep and light? I, I can't speak to that because I haven't looked at that in years. The last time I looked into it was when I was monitoring my sleep, and that was when I had my first kid <laughs> seven years ago. And I just so remember, it was more an issue of total volume of sleep than <laughs> yeah. Like I remember, I was reading something along the lines of you want you know five six hours of deep sleep and then two, three hours of light, something along those lines. Wow. And mine was like 20 minutes of deep sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, right, right now, because I go, I go in kind of uh, cycles. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, what I'm, I'm looking into a lot more and reaching out to some of my colleagues about, and I, I'm just beginning to get back into the studies on, is more on, uh, on uh, motor learning in a fatigue state. Okay. Yeah. Which we can have a conversation on uh, another day because right. that one is to me a big one. But but that one keeps getting brought up as I'm I'm learning more and more about different uh, training strategies and practice strategies from coaches at all levels, mm-hmm. and finding that in a lot of cases at all levels, there's there's certainly a lack of understanding of you know what a player is capable of while they're in a fatigue state, not even specifically the fact that injury risk goes up, but more Mm -hmm. of the classic example, they're running some kind of a wash drill, like the players, they're not getting it. We're going to keep doing this until they get it. And I'm like, I understand, but you're an hour and 40 minutes into practice. They've already played the equivalent of a five and a half set match. Synaptic function has gone down. Yeah, They're not going to learn Jack right now. So it's about, taking some of that simplifying the concepts to to help programs to uh better recognize that if we're going to to teach kind of a fine motor skill or any kind of mm-hmm. skill on the court best to do that earlier in practice right you know right after your dynamic warm-ups yeah yeah which is actually what we're going to be talking about here <laughs> that was, that was that, my seamless, seamless uh, yeah, segue. your segue yeah <laughs> because <laughs> and it's because it's funny because I'm looking at the email that you sent and about the, the polarizing article. Uh, and it's, I mean, I still laugh at it because I wrote that thing. I first started the blog in 2013 
And that was one of the early posts that I did Mm -hmm. because when I got to England, literally the, my, I I think it was my first day in Exeter. It wasn't, I hadn't moved yet. I was, I was just over there visiting the university, meeting my, my future advisors, that sort of thing. But on the trip, I went and visited one of the local clubs there, which, you know, for anybody who's familiar with non-U.S. club structure, it means adults. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah maybe some kids well in other countries besides england most definitely kids in england lots of adults might have some teenagers mixed in there so i watched them do jog and stretch and i haven't been coaching in a while but even i knew remembering the old days i'm like this is what are we doing jog and stretch this is so my head was nearly exploding watching this And when I actually got over and and started working with the Exeter programs at the university, they actually had me come help out with tryouts and we had to talk. I had to talk with the captains afterwards, you know, about getting on board with them. And they had done jog and stretch as part of the, their warm up for the the tryouts. And I said, I said, I got, I don't know, two or three conditions. My first condition was, there's no more jog and stretch. That's going out the window very first day. Fortunately, there was no pushback on that. Um, and it, and generally speaking, I think you see most people have gone away from that old school style. Though periodically, I do see things pop up that there was, there was an article written by a, a teenage player in I think the USA V magazine a couple of years mm-hmm. back where she talked about the only time she ever got hurt was when she didn't stretch before practice. And I'm just going, Oh God, why is this in USA V's magazine? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. And then just yesterday or the day before a pro club that I visited, put a thing up featuring a picture of one of their players doing a static stretch talking about how stretching reduces the chance of injury. I go, oh. No, <laughs> so I'm that gonna, stuff is still out there. No, for sure. And, and I'm going to uh, I'll email it to you, but um, I still work pretty closely with, with uh, some of the staff at the University of Calgary Center for Injury Prevention Research. And they had done a very long, very large study. I think it was over 300 athletes. Um, I think it was primarily in basketball, but they put together a a neuromuscular warm-up strategy, right? To to the lay person, that's basically a dynamic warm-up strategy with Mm -hmm. no actual static stretching. Really, they 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 made it, you know, sports specific in terms of these types of movements, right? Making sure that you activate the muscles you're going to be using in that sport, right? And and the results were almost mind blowing in terms of the fact that they had, I mean, some of these numbers about right, but they had like a 40, depending on the group, there's like a 40 to 70% decrease in acute injuries. Right. Cause uh, if you're you're like, you always got to break down those injuries into two categories, right? Your chronic overuse. And then you have your, yeah, right. And again, acute being that like, I really, you know, landed wrong and twist my ankle or I yeah. ACL or something that takes you out. Right. That happens. It happens suddenly, even though it could have been. It could building. have been coming for a while. Yeah. For a while. And then you have your chronic issues, which is way more common in the sport of volleyball. Mm-hmm. You know, just those patellar tenopathies, the knee pain, hip pain, shoulder pain. Yep. Uh, yep. For those, you know, there's not a lot of research to support that uh, stretching, be it dynamic or otherwise, actually helps all that much with chronic mm-hmm. injuries. That you do have to look at essentially just load monitoring that's the the best way to kind of figure out uh, how can we mitigate those um but it was interesting right because it's it's very particular movements and and one of the things like as i'm reading your article one of the things that that pops out to me that i see all the time that drives me wild almost forgetting for a second about even discussing static stretching we'll go to we'll go to the ball throws you're talking about yeah yeah is is one thing and i get it especially young athletes but, you know, when they say like every rep counts, especially when you're not in a fatigue state, when you're warming up, when you're prepping the, the central nervous system to get ready to fire and move mm-hmm. properly in a balanced fashion, the way you want it to, your body to function, 
paying attention to how you're doing these movements is beyond critical. Yeah. Nothing drives me nuts more than when I see kids while they're warming up going through the motions and not, you know, moving the body in the manner in which they're trying to prep it. Right. To move. And it's not, you know, there's, you don't have to do anything hyper complicated, right? It's, it's, it's just, if you're going to prime the body to be explosive you know, jogging, <laughs> yeah. jogging, little, you know, little kind of pogo hops. Okay. That's cool. That's great. Mm-hmm. It's like volleyball, you know, change yep. your direction, getting ready to load a jump quickly. Uh, it goes back to when you and I talked about the one mile run conditioning test. Yeah. It's kind of the same concept. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's, and it actually along those same lines, um, both in terms of warming up, but also in terms of training, there's hitting the ball against the wall. Which, on one level, I can understand learning the technique, learning the, the, the kinesthetics of a good arm mechanics before you incorporate the timing issues of jumping. And okay, fine. And I've done it myself to try to get you know, the athletes to understand the mechanical elements of the arm swing. But when you watch a player standing up against the wall, hitting the ball at their shoulder repeatedly, off center, this way, this way, I'm like, you're just training stuff you'd never want to actually have to do in a game. So if you're going to do it, okay, catch the ball and do it again properly. It, it, it sounds, and I have a, a couple examples, I mean, very clear examples of this. It sounds, uh, it doesn't sound that important, but I think it really, really is. Like if you're mm-hmm. doing it, doing it right. So for example, we had one of our, our clients, uh, SEC program, and uh, every now and then I'll just kind of jump into the data and, and see what I see, see if something stands out. And I looked at one of their training sessions, what the volleyballs with their, in their gym uh, with their strength coach. And I noticed for those unfamiliar with the system, you know, we'll, we'll measure like those impacts of their movement. Right. I noticed that this section of time, everyone was doing the same thing. There weren't jumps, but there was a lot of these little accelerations, these little impacts. Okay. But one girls were double that of everyone else's. So I, I called them up. I said, Hey, what are you doing at this time? Was it something like jump rope? And they said, yeah, we're doing, we're doing jump rope. Said, okay. Uh, does this player have shin splints? And the strength coach who I've become quite close with starts laughing. She goes, yes, David, she has, you know, <laughs> why are you asking me that she has shin splints? And I'm like, look, it's not a wild guess. However, I assumed it was jump rope. And the only way I could get that level of impact is if I stayed jumping rope in this just pure planar flexed toe position. Yeah. You know, where there's, there's no attenuation in that force all the way up. And my, you know, my ankle and my shin are taking a pounding. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to check and see, cause we're all, we're still every day. We're learning something new with. This right. And so she's like, yeah, she's a, she's, she's going to be a senior. She's had shin bunts her entire career. I was like, well, then, then we can experiment a little bit. <laughs> she goes, what do you want to do? Uh, I said, look, let's, let's just focus on getting her jump rope right. Get her more into the you know, balls of her feet yeah. and get impact down. And uh, lo and behold, quite proudly, we got it. She, you know, we, she got it down. I was more impressed that someone you know, who was going to her senior year could change the way she did that so quickly. But that change, you know, other variables aside, she didn't have shin splints for the first year of her collegiate career. And her strength coach will tell you uh, the biggest thing we changed was how she jumped rope. Right. But it, it translated to the court, how she jumped and landed. Yeah. So I like that story because it speaks to that exact point. When you're working through those movements over and over and over again, those motor patterns become habit, right? Practice mm-hmm. doesn't make perfect practice makes permanent. Yep. That whole concept. So if you're going to be going through these warmups, uh, while well, they don't have to be exactly sport specific, but just more movement specific. Kind of sports specificity on training. Yeah. 
because some people get really hyper sport specific and I start telling them like, you know, I don't know if I, I think we're, am I cutting out or you can hear me? Okay. I can hear you now. You did disappear for a little bit there, but I oh. think your point was all right. So okay. cool. we can carry on. <laughs> I'll make connection. So, um, you know, a lot, I, I talk to, to strength coaches a lot because one of the things that virtually any program doing any kind of strength conditioning training will do is uh, like depth drops off of a box. Off the box, yeah. And this was another thing where you, you understand why it's being done, right? We're trying to get them to learn how to land well and mm -hmm. also build up their kind of tendon tolerance to those landing impact forces, those decelerated forces, which are the highest in the sport. Right. But, you know, does it translate? Well, you know, you're almost never dropping perfectly, you know, on any kind of attack. Right. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things that I started looking into and then started recommending to people that has worked out very well so far anecdotally, but based on some of the data we've been able to collect was we'd say, all right, if you're going to do a depth drop, have them drop in front of the net, like a week, a uh, foot or two away from the net or even the wall. Okay. And what's fascinating is what you see is with some athletes, when you put that like game specific stemu uh, visual stimulus in front of them, right, completely change the way they land, even yeah. drop it off the box. Right. You're like, oh, I don't want to hit. You know, I'm like, yeah, you're, you're like this far away still. Yeah. Um, and you should still have flexion at the hips, knees, and ankles without your face going way before in front of your toes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's those kinds of, of things that I, I think you'd agree more and more programs are starting to implement. Um, but yeah, if there's one thing that any coach can take away from these kinds of conversations is don't be lax when you're running them through any kind of a, you know, game prep movement warm up on technique and what it is you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, in a lot of ways, dynamic warm up has become what jog and stretch used to be, which was the coach being lazy and just going, go do your thing while I'm over here doing my plan or putting in my lineup or whatever the coach is doing so that they don't, they know it's being done automatically. They don't have to give it a lot of attention. And so one of my pet peeves is if I, if I'm watching a team do a dynamic warm up, you know, this kid not doing the, 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 the exercise to the full extent that they're supposed to be doing it. Like they're doing side lunges and they kind of just, you know, they might lean a little bit, maybe bend their knee a little bit, take three steps to do the next one because they're really not that interested in doing it. Okay, which is fine if you're 14 years old and you're pretty pliable. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're in college and your body needs a little bit more to get itself prepared, you might want to take it the more seriously. Well, you're starting to dig in too to where I, I would – you know, I would say to the kid not doing it properly, something like that. I wouldn't throw it into the bucket of a waste in terms of it not helping at all. Mm -hmm. I would throw it in the bucket of a waste in terms of wasted opportunity. Yeah. Because, you know, it's you know, he's still priming some of the musculature, but, you know, it goes back to my Olympic lifting coaching days where, you know, a lot of the people I would, I would train would be surprised with the amount of mobility I would have them do, you know, after I'd warm them up and pre-lift right. because a lot of other people think like, Oh, we want the muscle to be tight. I can lift harder and lift. I can lift more, more weight, just like sprinters. Sprinters don't like to stretch very much. They want to have that, that muscle tight and explosive. Right. Theoretically it increase, increases injury risk, but it also theoretically increases your ability to run faster. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's balance. Uh, but then what I'd explain to them is like, notice I'm not sitting here stretching your hamstring. Like we're not doing any static stretching. Right. We're moving a joint. We're creating space in a joint. And specific to Olympic lifting, that is to make sure you can get the proper depth to lift a heavier weight. Right. Because of the range of motion. It's a little different in a sport like volleyball because you don't need oftentimes these extreme ranges of motion at the hip. Mm -hmm. But the concept in my mind is still the same to where you're priming those tissues. You make sure there's enough space there. And you can, with a proper dynamic warm-up, you can <laughs> – really increase some range of motion, especially some of these kids who've been sitting down all day in class. Yeah. Right. They just need to, to, again, prime those tissues, open them up, get some space in the hip and shoulder capsules so that they can get a full range and feel more comfortable, more confident when they attack. 
and move dynamically. So I know, positioning it that way, I found to be really, really effective. It's like, mm-hmm. the reason we go this deep is because, hey, let's think you, you're in position as a defensive position. You need to do like a deep lunge to get a pass to your right. Right. It'd be nice if your body's prepped for that. Yep. And, and let's be honest, it doesn't take an hour and a half of prep. It's like, get your body moving. You know, again, get that hip capsule getting, you know, pushing into the side, into the glute need and just getting everything kind of moving and warmed up and loose and open. That can serve as the difference between you missing or getting this, this, uh, this dig. Yeah. It really can. Now that's, that's hard to like research. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but in that presentation, I found it's gotten people I've trained to, 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 to treat uh, those warm up, dynamic warm up and more like dynamic sports specific stretching uh with a lot more sincerity right yeah it's it's been interesting being in professional gyms in europe and of course you're going to get a mix of of what actually gets implemented and the philosophies involved and and a lot of times what i've seen in pre-match situations not talking about training i'll I'll address that in a second but in pre-match situations a lot of times the players will just be left to do what you need to do. There won't be a formalized, we're all going to line up, we're going to do the dynamic. Maybe they, they run a few laps around the, the gym doing a variety of different things and some guys will be doing their bands for their shoulders. And so it ends up being very individualized. Mm-hmm. Whereas a lot of what you'll see at the juniors level or in the college levels, everybody's pretty much doing the same thing. Maybe with something that happens afterwards for five. Okay, you got five minutes to whatever else you need to do. In training, a lot of times what I'll see is, and this will probably surprise a lot of people, is the amount of what some people call prehab, uh, some people call activation. Some I refer to it with my players as just stabilization work, mm-hmm. because you're talking core, you're talking lower body, you're talking shoulders all the things that can have problems, you know, if they're not uh, strong and stable. But the pros are doing that like 45 minutes a day before their first session, whether that be the first session going to the weight room or the first session of being on the court doing serve and pass or, you know, whatever it happens to be that day. And it's intense and they're, they're tired after they do it. It's the, so individualization, if you have the proper kind of background knowledge and context for that athlete, mm-hmm. going to always be the way to go. So understanding in the youth, youth setting, individualization becomes complex because A, in a way, they kind of haven't injured themselves yet. So we don't know to individualize, right? Yeah. So uh, again, I'll use myself as, as an example here. I shredded both my shoulders at the ripe old age of 15. Mm-hmm. You know, and... Uh, ended a rather promising swimming career. So when I finally got back into to being able to work out again properly 12 years later, uh, I would do like a warm up, and then I would do about 30 minutes on my shoulders alone. Right. Get them into a position to where I could lift properly without pain. Now that's yeah. an extreme example, um, but it kind of goes back to a, Another situation we had with, uh, I was at the, the youth nationals, the high performance which uh-huh. they in Fort Lauderdale often, which is the bent of, best event in the world, primarily because it's 10 minutes from my office. <laughs> and <laughs> so we can drive over there. It's wonderful. And, and a lot of subjects. Yeah. <laughs> Except for when the water main broke that one year. I don't no, know that, yeah, that, that can cause some problems. That was super fun. Um, but, uh, what was really interesting was there's actually the Canadian youth, one of the Canadian youth teams came over and this was, I think the first year I was working for Verts. It's like five or six years ago now. And, you know, we're just talking about their application of the, the system. And he said, yeah, it's, you know, it's really interesting though. Our, our best player we've noticed, he doesn't hit his max vertical ever until the third set. Like his, his average high always higher in the third set. Mm-hmm. And kind of now I'm he said, what do you guys do for warm up?" He's like, well, we all make, when I asked him that question, they go, we all do the same. Oh, oh, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so now we have this information. 
uh, why don't you try switching up his warm up, even if it's just giving him a little more? Mm-hmm. Because you, you don't want him peaking in the third set. You want him to be ready to go to, to start, I imagine. I mean, I'm still right. learning about volleyball at that point. Yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah, of course. And it was great because they did it there at the tournament. And they came back the next day, like, we got it in the second set this time. Like, and that <laughs> so we're, we're tweaking and finding out how it works. But I think it's a, it's a beautiful example of individualization because some, it goes back to, I know we're jumping a little bit around here, but it goes back to like training load periodization. Right. Some people swear if I've got a Friday, Saturday match, we should peak on Wednesday and then, you know, go down Thursday, Friday. And yeah, the, the science actually supports that. But I have seen firsthand certain athletes like a reverse periodization model where they yeah. like butt kick the day before the match and that's when they'll perform the best. Right. Right. Doesn't mean it's, you know, right or wrong globally. It's just that works best for the athlete. And if you're able to find that out, awesome. Takes well, and, and it speaks to something that I know some clubs are playing around with. I, I don't know how far it's gone yet in terms of kind of formal analysis, but of doing a lift shortly before they go on the court. Mm-hmm. Not like a morning lift to practice in the afternoon, but like a, a lift two hours, an hour and a half before you walk into the gym as part of your activation. Now, obviously, you're not going to lift to the point of exhaustion and then sure. you don't got nothing left, but it's part of the activation just to what you were speaking to before. There's been, there's been, there's a lot of ongoing research there. Uh, some people I know absolutely love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a concept known as micro dosing as well that came out of Europe. I know it's used a lot in Brazil and I've seen a lot more college programs using that where they're doing some semblance of lift every single day. Right. Uh, and again, we're talking about lift. We're not talking like, you know, three rep max at yeah. 85%. Like, but they're doing some semblance of lift. And, and when you do it pre game, what they're trying to do there is, is kind of activate that the post potentiation activation, right? Like mm-hmm. if you, if you're going to go jump, uh, theoretically, you're going to jump a lot higher. If you just did like a, like a med ball throw, uh, you do a few heavy med ball throws and then you right. go jump. Yeah. I see people have like three inches immediately. <laughs> uh, it's really cool and kind of trippy. And, and I, I work with uh, <clears throat> uh, a guy who's become a friend of mine. He created this, this uh, like carbon fiber pack for the military that you wear. I don't know if I told yeah. you, about that. but what it does is you wear it on your back and then it kind of straps the outside of your knee and goes to your wrist and it's just a, a cord that gives you like six, six to eight pounds of resistance consistently. Okay. Basically. Interesting. But because of the way it does it, it kind of forces you, it cues you to keep a activated midline. Okay. So more neutral spine. I've actually been using it for two years. It's like a test as he's bringing it around. And it's freaking amazing. <laughs> like, it's like voodoo. You know, someone like me who jumps and tests my jumps constantly because I'm yeah. you know, working on our stuff. Yeah, I, I'll get, you know, I jumps like uh, not only two inches higher, but I like increase my reactive strength from like a 2.4 to a 2.9. If anyone knows what reactive strength is, that's a ridiculous jump. <laughs> um, and I did it after only jumping like five times with this thing on my back. Yeah. So, there, there are different really cool ways to prime the system. And, you know, that being said, it doesn't always have to be a crazy long duration. There are some no. quick, but actually I'm glad you brought up the lifting example because that when done properly, it's like legal cheating. If you're going to go like, especially the first set, <laughs> <laughs> especially the first set, you're going to be, uh, you'll be primed to jump higher for sure. Like, Well, it's an interesting topic because just this year, women's volleyball at the NCAA level, they do what we call a 4-4-5-5-1, where each team has the court first for four minutes and then five five minutes by themselves, no shared. They've got the, you know, you're on your own half of the court prior to that. But in the men's game, they do a lot more normally, not this year, because of COVID, but they normally, they have a lot more shared over the net stuff happening in their game. And if you go overseas, you see shared hitting warmups all the time. You just hit line. So you start going back to the concussion thing we talked about before. 
uh, which speaks, and, and for people who may not even realize why the stepping around would make that much of a difference. Well, if you're hitting line and you step under <laughs> to go get a ball, you're directly in the line of the people hitting the ball because you don't hit cross court anywhere. Uh, but anyway, that's the side point. And the, the, the story that, that Dr. McDonald talks about in his presentation, I know it's one story, but you've been around long enough to where you've seen it a lot. But it was, uh, you know, one kid, he was a senior. I, I saw the video of him getting hit. And it looks like, oh, you know, ow. Yeah. He was out three months and didn't get to go to graduation. Wow. Like, uh, and, and, and you look at, you know, around the world, and that's why I'm, I'm really excited. I'm very, very excited, genuinely, to, to present some of this with him for the, the Latin American market mm -hmm. um, on that other show because that's not being – being looked at but right. it's not even it's not top of mind and i and i get it if it hasn't been presented yeah but if they're not being tested for a concussion then you don't know that these concussions are taking place exactly and people, even within the sport of volleyball in different circles right if you've if you've gone to enough abca seminars or you've been on your shows you've you've heard of these things mm -hmm. if you hadn't you say yeah concussions in volleyball like from what the ball hitting you i'm like yeah <laughs> yeah most or, of them are the ball not the not yeah the ball. Some are the right. floor. Most are the yeah. Ball. Yeah. The floor is actually very infrequent. Sometimes it's the elbows of the blocker next to you coming down on top of your head. I've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, especially in the women's side of the game, it's, it's the ball. It, it's always been kind of a curiosity to me. And, and clearly it's a biomechanical thing. Guys don't tend to take those sorts of shots to the head, even though the ball is flying that much faster in the men's game, just their reaction speeds are, just to, even if just, you know, it's more the shoulder than the dome. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I haven't personally seen data on the, the differences in amount. I mean, the, the strong majority of our clients are women's teams. Mm -hmm. But I do recall, you know, one particular program, I was chatting with them, and she's not to laugh at this because it's not funny, but they're okay. But they had, um, I think in their... I don't remember if it was fall or spring season, but they had four concussions. Yeah. Three of which were on the court, one of which was off the court. Something else happening. But right. uh, ROTC, actually. But but I remember, again, this was years ago. And so that was still even, I was like, four concussions in volleyball? And that's when I like, yeah, opened my eyes. I'm like, oh, that makes Ooh. no sense. And then I started looking, <laughs> wow, this is way more common than I would have anticipated. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's not ankle sprain common, thank God, but it's... Uh, right. It's it's there and I, and what's what was so neat looking at some of the data with uh, with Carrie was you know segmenting it into when it happens mm -hmm. because so most of it is actually happening in practice that's good because that means we can more easily can adapt things in practice to, yeah, to avoid to that yeah it. yeah that, I mean that is it's really interesting news because I've seen it the other way when I was coaching in Sweden. One of my middles who had played at Washington State came around on the slide, really had no block there, speaking to your point about the Canadians not being able to block against each other, and just laid out the line defender, yeah. just flattened her. And I'm just one of those lying on the court looking for birds and stars and stuff like that. So, yeah, it happens. <laughs>